Sounds good. So it's 10 a.m. Um, I've opened the doors. Welcome, welcome, everybody. See, people have started to join. Hello. Hi, Jess. Good morning. My name is Christina from Ref Genius, and we have Sam Bowley and Greg Mayer from, um, Sam is from Metadata and Greg is from Syncory. Hello, I'm giving everybody a Zoom wave. We're morning, just giving it a couple evening. of moments so that everybody can join in. In the meantime, if you want to type in the chat and tell us where you're from. Vancouver, BC, amazing. All right. Not too far from here. I'm in the Pacific Northwest. All right, I see Arizona. Shout out to Arizona. All right, a few people up late at night in India. That's good. Oh, I see someone from San Diego. Hi, I'm in Orange County, California. Awesome. So I'm going to start with a few housekeeping rules. Um, again, my name is Christina. I'm from Ref Genius. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining in. Um, today's topic will be about how RevOps can make every seller more effective. And we have Greg Meyer from Syncovy and Sam Bowley from Metadata. Um, question and answers are highly encouraged feel free to type in the chat or use the q a feature although at the end of the session you'll be able to raise hand and then ask your questions live um, again if you have any questions inputs at all feel free to email hello ffgenius.com and then this will be recorded and will be shared after the event so without further ado i'm gonna hand it over to Greg and sam all right. Thanks, Christina. And hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so today we wanted to get things started with uh, just a simple poll. So Christina, if you could launch the uh, poll. We're just wondering, um, sort of off the cuff, as a, a seller, um, do you think that peeps would be more effective with either unlimited leads, a few highly qualified leads, a uh, sorted list of leads or a target segment. So we'd love to know what you think. Go ahead and uh, take a minute and vote in this poll. Um, as we're waiting for a few more people to join, we just wanted to get an idea of what you're thinking. All right, do we have uh, any answers coming in yet? All right, well, uh, as we're waiting for that to tally up, it looks like uh, most people would like a target segment, not surprising. Um, and I'm interested here to note that uh, people, not everyone picked unlimited leads and not uh, everyone picked, looked like a target segment, then few highly qualified and then sorted. So we can uh, pick that up a little bit later. Um, but uh, just to kick everything off here, um, I'm a product manager at Syncry. Syncry is a data automation platform to help you connect all of your go-to-market applications and make them all look like uh, they're running from one database. And uh, Sam, do you have a quick commercial about metadata? 
Sure. So I'm Sam Boley. I do uh, RevOps for Metadata. And uh, Metadata is a uh, first is the first demand generation platform that launches paid campaign experiments and optimizes to revenue. Um, marketers typically use uh, Metadata to automate the repeatable time consuming parts of running paid campaigns so they can focus their time and energy on creative and strategy. All right. Thanks for that. Um, so today we're going to focus on uh, two things here. We are focusing on, um, you know, sales touches uh, when thinking about um, effectiveness and a touch here, we're thinking about uh, the ways in which salespeople engage with their prospects. So this could be, um, it could be a call, it could be an email, it could be a, you know, a LinkedIn uh, conversation, it could be almost anything you can think of. And when you look at this, um, this meme over here that I've presented on the screen, I think that it's easy for sellers to look at, you know, almost anything and think, hey, this is a hot lead. Um, and when we think about like, every lead is not necessarily, you know, a great lead. And so focusing on the quality of those interactions um, is really important. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about improving, um, you know, the quality of those operations, getting access for your sales team to, uh, you know, better quality leads and accounts. And also a little bit about, you know, what they should do and Sam, what you're doing with your team when, you know, things aren't working um, and when things are working. Um, so uh, I like to include a little bit of data. I did some research on um, sales touches and this is a stat from the bridge group. Uh, so this is a group that does lots of research on sales conversations and sales, um, sales motions. And what they found is that uh, quality conversations are going down. Um, you know, you see this uh, line going from about, you know, eight per day down to in 2020, it was four per day on average, and it might be lower, you know, so any interaction here between uh, the sales team and an individual lead contact could be a quality conversation, but it's, it's becoming harder to find it. And the number of attempts to get those conversations, either because people aren't answering uh, their emails or their, you know, they have so many inboxes, those attempts are going up over time as well. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure how many uh, inbound conversations you get on a day, on a daily, Sam, but uh, I get a bunch and, you know, it's hard to know, uh, you know, which ones to focus on. Um, so let's talk about why we need to increase sales touches overall. Um, you know, the team needs uh, better data so you can maximize the, the number of touches in every day. Um, and accurate data, you know, means uh, both the, you're talking to the right person with, um, you know, the right message at the right time. And also, you know that you're talking to the person you think you're talking to. Um, and, oh, did that? And also, um, you know, when you are not getting rapid data, not getting accurate data, um, that time that you're trying to search for that data and cleaning it up is time that you're spent, you know, not selling. So when we think about overall, the overall quality of sales interactions, um, you know, we're thinking about um, access to the data. Do they have the information that they need in order to talk to sellers? Um, and it's really easy, you know, in that 30 seconds where you're asking for permission to talk to somebody um, that you might waste their time. You know, you might know, not know um, why they want to speak to you today and what is causing them, uh, you know, to potentially be in market looking for uh, information. So to sum up, you know, if, if you have, you know, access to that uh, data that makes it um, the right time, the right message, the right person, that it's possible to have uh, those quality interactions um, much more often. So, you know, now that we've gone through that, you know, sort of as a, a basic definition, I wanted to open up to you, Sam, and, and ask you, um, 
what are you doing to get your sales team, uh, you know, better access to data, maximizing sales touches, and how are you making it easy for them? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, let me ask you to go back to the uh, to the meme slide, if you could. Sure. And let's let's take these two bullet points and let's talk at it at a at a really high level, and then we'll drill down into what we're doing for the sellers here at Metadata. Um, my philosophy in RevOps is that sales reps, and we'll call sales reps, SDRs, AEs, CSMs, anybody on, a, on the go-to-market side of the house can really only control two things. They can control the number of touches that they can make in a day or a week or a month and the quality of those interactions. You can't just wake up one day and tell the salespeople, you need to improve your lead conversion rate by three points. You can't say, I need you to raise average selling price by $10,000, or you need to improve your win rate by you know, 5%. All of those things are great, and they're all measurements that we, or we're all beholden to, but the sales rep, what they can do is they can put more touches in a day and they can try to improve the quality of those touches. And quality could be any number of things, right? It could be enablement so that they understand the product better. Quality could be from the marketing side of the house to make sure that they're talking to the right personas and job titles and industry. Quality can also, be, can also mean speed to lead which is kind of one of the things that we're talking about today in that uh, you, you're working the, the right targets at the right time. So that's the core philosophy behind uh, what we're talking about today is how do we get sales reps to put more time back in their day so that they have opportunity to uh, make those sales touches? And then can we ensure that the quality of those interactions are as uh, streamlined as possible. Got so, it. in go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask you: um, Do you have a, a structure where they are able, where sales reps are able to measure those, not only the touches but the quality of those touches today? Like, where do they go in order to know that that happened? Is that a ongoing conversation with their um, their boss in a in a one on one, or are, is there ways for their are there ways for them to know that they're having that uh, quality conversation while it's happening or, or shortly after? That's a great question. Um, obviously, the number of touches is easily measurable across all the different platforms. Um, you can see, you know, with LinkedIn sales nav, you can see the number of LinkedIn in-mails that are being sent. With Salesforce, you can obviously see the number of activities that are being logged. Like you can get a good feel for number of touches pretty easily. Um, for the quality of those interactions, this is where we talk about, at least the way I think about it is, you can infer a lot of that information on quality when you now look at the KPIs like average sales price and conversion, lead conversion or win rate. Those KPIs, while not directly impacted by what sales reps do, are indirectly impacted by the quality of those conversations. And you can infer a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously now with the advent of things like gong and chorus, call recording, uh, it's pretty easy to, to start to digest what quality looks like and where it can be improved. Mm -hmm. And um, Sam, when you're thinking about uh, the context of the messages that uh, you know, people are sharing and getting uh, responses back from uh, from prospects. Is there also a way that you are looking at the quality in the um, related to how many people reply, how many people, um, you know, in a typical sequence, for example, that you are sending out, um, some people are gonna respond and some people are going to, uh, you know, not respond. Um, are you looking at um, the interactions from the standpoint of the, the sequence? Are you looking at it from the overall campaign? What are you doing to um, 
from a, a management standpoint to uh, better understand how how those things are working. So as the uh, the original uh, slide said, right, I'm a data nerd. You're a data mm -hmm. nerd. We're in yep. this process because we like all the data. So any piece of data that you can measure, um, you know, provides information for the overall structure. So the that's a long winded say way of saying yes, all of the above. Huh. If if we can if we can measure uh, sequence success, reply rates, whether we're talking about outreach sequences or, you know, uh, drip campaigns in marketing, any kind of long tail uh, automation, right? Uh, A-B test the hell out of everything, measure it by rep, measure it by uh, sequence, measure it by open rate, measure it by response rate, Anywhere mm -hmm. that you can try to get improvement that will help affect one of these two major metrics in terms of quality mm -hmm. and putting more time back into the seller's day is an avenue that has to be at least explored every right. time you get the chance. Um, so uh, one of the things that people pointed out in the poll was you know looking for a sorted list of leads. So sorted by... Um, you know, things you might sort on to increase quality might be the how recent uh, the lead was in terms of the interaction or how frequently the person has contacted you. What are the ways that you are making it easy for uh, your reps to look at, uh, say, the several hundred people that they have in their world and, um, uh, you know, provide basically a way for them to sort it to look at the accounts that are more likely to respond or uh, the people that are more likely, likely to respond? Sure, that's a great question. I appreciate you teeing me up like that. Um, let's, have, uh, let's have some story time with Grandpa Sam. And uh, <laughs> not too long ago, we went through an exercise of understanding what our ICP is. And a uh, quick plug, we do use Syncery and I absolutely love the tool and it helps us to get product usage data from our platform into Salesforce. And we did uh, uh, a lot of analysis to see not just what our win rates are, but actual renewal rates and use net retention and the customers that use our platform, they renew, they expand, they upsell to define our ICP. And then we worked backwards and we took that ICP and we repositioned some of our go-to-market strategies. And now when leads come inbound, we bucketize them into a tier A lead, a tier B lead, a tier C lead, where A leads are we know that they're within our ICP. And these are the people that we absolutely think that they would make great customers and beyond just winning the first deal, have the most likelihood to renew and upsell with us over time to improve lifetime value. So that's one of those methods of quality when we talk about what's on the slide right now is that these leads, are the quality that we want to become our customers. So if I have a, a segmented list of, you know, 50 inbound leads that came in because of a webinar, I'm going to bucketize those into tier A leads, tier B leads, tier C leads, so that the SDRs, the AEs can prioritize their time with people that we want to be customers because we know what great customers look like with metadata. Right. So it, it sounds like even when you're getting a big bucket of leads into your world that you are helping out your sellers by um, pre-filtering what you get uh, so that they are having a better likelihood of having that, you know, quality interaction. Um, oh, correct. I yeah. mean, I, when you think about, you know, sales ops or rev ops 10 years ago, it was all about just getting the leads into Salesforce, into the hands of the seller so that they could do their magic. But in, in, in this day and age where data enrichment is readily available and for the most part, relatively cheap, like this becomes table stakes nowadays. 
it it's it really does mean by the time that that lead gets to an SDR or an AE, you need to have more than just the email address and a phone number. You really need to know as much about their business as you can because it's available and surface that information to the SDRs, to the AEs, so that when they do that first touch, that cold outreach, you're not just doing, hi, I'm Sam with metadata. I think you'd make a good customer. Can we talk? It's like, hey, you look at, you look like other customers like us. You're probably having a similar issue. Here's how we've solved this problem. And it's that, um, you know, looks like data, lookalike data that helps is one of those quality metrics that you can do to help mm -hmm. make your sellers that much more effective. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering in particular with lookalike or with uh, scoring those inbound uh, leads, uh, what do you do when you get um, you know, contacts from a small company versus contacts from a larger company and they are exhibiting similar behaviors? So on the prospect level, it looks kind of similar. But um, you as a human, you might look at it and say, well, I know that when someone comes from one of our target customers and it is of this level and that sort of person that it's a really strong signal. But when it comes from, let's say a giant company, it might just be somebody doing research. Do you have a technique that you use to um, you know, break those down in terms of the scoring or another way in the top of funnel to alert sellers? Well, I mean, yes and no. Uh, you're always going to have a certain amount of people that are just kicking the tires, mm -hmm. right? But you can, <clears throat> tire kickers do behave a certain way when you're looking at like website data, and you can use that to incorporate into your scoring. Um, we also know from our uh, ICP analysis that, um, you know, really gigantic companies, the IBMs of the world, mm -hmm. um, don't often come inbound and also, you know, don't necessarily make great customers for us these days. So we have to take all of that with kind of a trending analysis of, of what's best for your business mm -hmm. and try to make the best educated guess that you can. And, um, you know, I've been uh, doing this for 10 years now and I'm a huge believer in fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I get by with lying to companies about how good I am at RevOps and, and uh, no, I'm kidding. That's just humor. But like there is something to say about failing fast, right? Yeah. It's OK to make mistakes. It's OK to 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 put forth an MVP solution and then iterate over time as the data changes, as the business evolves, as you learn more. Like a lot of these things are not set it and forget it. It's it's evolved over time. Right. Again, a really long-winded way of answering your question. Sure. Do you have a, a top two or three metrics that you look at today to, um, you know, determine your ICP, um, you know, based on what you're seeing? So when uh, more story time with grandpa, uh, we looked at, um, number one, how did you use our platform? Mm-hmm. That was first and foremost. So if you're using the platform, and I'm not talking about like Pindo usage, which is time on site. I'm talking about things like, are you actually using the platform as it was intended? You know, launching campaigns, creating experiments, you know, generating leads, et cetera, those kind of results. Then we looked at those customers that uh, renewed and or upsold and looked for common information among those customers and common information that's easy to do for trend analysis is what industry they're in, who the, uh, what the size of the company is and who the principal decision maker was, the title of the decision maker for both the renewal and the, the new logo sale and work backwards from there. Mm -hmm. So, when I look at top of funnel metrics now for our ICP, it's easy to bucket into those categories and go, oh, you are in the bullseye of our sweet spot, right? You are in the right customer employee range. 
you're in the right industry and you have the right job title to, to be able to, to spend budgeted or unbudgeted funds. So you go to the top of the list. Like I absolutely want to move heaven and earth to make sure that you were spoken to as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And for the sellers out there who, um, you know, interpret those signals correctly, find that right person. Um, how do you measure, how do you help them, uh, measure the goodness of that like interaction? Like, do you have any tips? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, the things that are top of mind for me, I'm looking for how long does it take that lead to convert? Like the number of leads that do convert, how long does it take to convert? Um, are we getting access to power within the deal? So I'm looking at opportunity contact roles to see who the job titles are of all the players that are involved in the buying process. Obviously, ASP is huge. Time to close is huge. Like all of these things are downstream implications of the quality of the interaction that the SDR and the AE are having in the sales process. Mm -hmm. um, I want to switch gears a moment, Sam, and talk a little bit about what happens when uh, that seller finds a problem with the data. Do you have like a separate ticket type or a way internally that you are, um, as a RevOps team, uh, alerting, hey, there's a problem with this data, I need to fix it, or uh, how, do you how do you handle that? Well, we're still a small team, and uh, Slack is our virtual HQ, so I get pinged by the reps, um, and I, I keep a running backlog of all the things that I can do in order to improve the quality of life of the sellers. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really talking about leads per se right now, but we rolled out CPQ last summer, uh, mm -hmm. configure price quote for all the non-CPQ enthusiasts on the webinar. And um, that was a dramatic Titanic shift in process uh, going from the wild west of, you know, word documents to, now you have to do follow within the guardrails of everything. And it's been an iterative process. Anywhere that we can shave off five minutes, three minutes in the approval process or the quoting process, anything that puts more time back into the day of the seller, like I'm all for getting that kind of feedback um, because salespeople are expensive, right? You don't want them to fail. You want them to be successful and anything that you can do to put more time back in their day so that they can talk to more prospects, spend more time on deals and process, any of that stuff is, is worth its weight in gold. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for teams that are bringing on brand new sellers and getting them integrated into this process so that when they join, it's easy for them to uh, sort of get swimming? Yeah. Um, my favorite tool, right? My favorite tip right now is um, we use a little tool called Loom, which is lets you to record videos. And I have created a gigantic Loom directory of all the how to's for common questions that I get from the AE. So I've got like half a dozen or a dozen CPQ videos. I've got half a dozen videos on, on how our Salesforce Lightning experience works. Um, I've got you know, some videos for the CSMs on how we do customer health scoring. And instead of scheduling, and we've, we've rolled it out. So our SDR manager, she put together a series of videos on how to use outreach. So now instead of all of these new hires scheduling one-on-ones with me or with other, you know, peers, these Loom videos become force multipliers. Um, right. Sounds like you're taking, they can yeah. go ask, they can rewatch the multiple times. And then um, because this has worked so well, we recently migrated from chorus to gong and we're using, uh, we're running a spiff uh, right now for the AEs, uh, for all the team to go listen to gong calls and save the best snippets um, into directories so that they're choosing what the best tips are that they hear from quality interactions on calls into a library repository so that they can draw back on it again at a later date or future new hires can do it or 
you know, any methodology that we can put in place so that they can steal the best of the best mm -hmm. from the best is, is just going to make the team, the entire, it raises the quality of all players. So, so it sounds the, yeah. So it sounds like you are increasing the number of uh, quality interactions that are shared with the team as well. So that to. it make right. So that makes it easier for them to do their job, and uh, th that when people are coming to you, also it is uh, a leveled up experience. Hey, how do I do? How do I do that once I already looked at this, um, you know, instructional video rather than uh, show me for the first time? Yeah. So Grandpa Sam is. Um, kind of a sarcastic a-hole like it's it's a fun personality but i tell all of them up front is like hey you can ask me anything that you want but if you ask me something that's in one of those loom videos you're going to get a sarcastic response and i don't want anybody to get stuck but i do need you to think for yourself at some point that's how that's how this force multiplier thing works uh -huh. that is um a great segue, I think, into the questions that people might have for us. Um, and so I want to open it up for questions. It looks like we have a question from uh, Jess asking, um, how is total impact measured? And how can how do you know it can be attributed to your work rather than other external variables? You want to take a stab at that? Sure. Um... Just great question. Welcome to the party. Um, the way I would think about it is that if you are looking at a at each each rep, each sequence, each whatever as a baseline, you can then start to infer where variations occur. So if I have a typical seller who is selling an ASP of 40K and they're at a, a historical quota attainment rate of 70%. And um, we introduce the new Loom video process or we introduce the gong process and they participate in the Loom training or the Loom or the gong spiff or whatever. And they start to comment on lots of videos or listen to lots of gong calls and you see that the, the ASP goes up or the, the, win, the quota attainment rate goes up, I would infer that that is a result of the quality of training that they're getting or some external variable that's changing the baseline. Um, everyone has a baseline trend basically in Salesforce for all of the data. It's just a matter of looking at that historical, understand the baseline, figure out where the inflection points are and measure and iterate from there. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Um, I'm wondering if you're also looking at um, uh, segmenting the interaction quality on your teams among sellers with more or less tenure. Do you, do you, um, do you break that down or do you look at just people with quota and people who are ramping? Well, you look at all of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, for certain tenure matters, I think the uh, the average rule of thumb is that it takes what five or six months for quota for sellers to 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 stop ramping, but it probably takes like 16, 12, 18 months in order for them to really hit their stride as sellers. So you're looking at at how the the KPIs change all along the journey. Mm -hmm. um, you also, and then you can layer in everything about that. Like, okay, I've had three different sellers in this territory. Maybe it's not the sellers. Maybe it's the territory. Maybe it's, maybe it is the sellers who knows, but you, until you start to actually look and understand how the, the firmographic and the behavioral data matters, you just, it just becomes guesses. Mm -hmm. And as RevOps, my goal is to take as much of the guesswork out of leadership's hands as possible and replace it with data, mm -hmm. um, while at the same time trying to ensure that for the sellers, they have as much time to do sell selling and they're as effective as they possibly can be when they're, when they're selling. Yeah, we have a question here about how to map 
uh, LinkedIn messages back to the rest of your communications. I know that um, it's possible to, you know, sort of get a manual prompt, but not all of those messaging conversations are captured. Do you have a suggestion for uh, how you link conversations that are happening on LinkedIn back to, let's say, Salesforce or some other system of record? Well, I think anybody that's on the webinar knows uh, Salesforce and LinkedIn uh, don't play nice together. Um, thank you, Microsoft. <laughs> um, so I do recommend that there is a particular step in sequences for sending the in-mail. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can look at uh, conversion rates after that sequence step to see if the quality of that in-mail uh, makes a difference. Um, there are some hack tools that I don't uh, remember off the top of my head that can take uh, in-mail messages to Salesforce, I think. Um, and then you could obviously label them a certain way that way. Um, but I think okay. that I think that's my the easy answer off the top of my head. Sure, I don't think there is a, you know a definitive way to do that just yet. Um, you mentioned it, using yeah, you mentioned using Loom. Uh, are your sellers using Loom to do outbound video messaging or doing any other kind of uh, video messaging to prospects? They are. Um, the SDRs are actually doing it through Drift, and uh -huh. we have seen really good. Uh, response rates from a well-crafted video. Um, and then some of the sellers are actually using Loom in their outbound messaging um, to obviously to mixed results. Again, it's one of those things that's like, I don't know if it's the message or the prospect or the volume that needs to be done, but yeah, uh, there are there are some prospects that are definitely receptive to asynchronous communication like Loom does. Mm -hmm. And when it hits, I think it hits really well. Okay. And uh, I just have one last question um, for, for new RevOps uh, managers and leaders that are you know, getting started. Do you have any advice for them on how to maximize these uh, good sales touches and make sure that uh, they're of high quality. Any sort of parting thoughts? Uh, sure. Uh, the nerd answer is going to be measure everything. If you can get your hands on the data, get your hands on the data. Um, then um, work on establishing trends, like establish the baseline, look at the trend, and let the data start to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Then share that information up and it took me a little while to do this to learn this in my lifetime but share that information up from a place of love meaning that it's very easy to take trend analysis of ae performance and turn it into a red wedding right where you just chop off the bottom half and that doesn't do anybody any good. It has to come from a place of love where you're going, here's what our best sellers look like. What can we do to try to enable the B and C reps to, to become A players rather than just cut the bottom? Um, and so it's when you understand the data and you can speak to the data, make sure that you're let the data speak for itself. Obviously, don't try to interpret for the masses, but come from a place of where we're trying to make everybody successful as opposed to, you know, this guy, this guy, and that girl all need to go. Like, that's that's not helpful in the long run. I love the uh, message of uh, love from RevOps. Um, it's definitely something that uh, will help you, I think, to... Um, get uh, more support from your sellers. Um, so I want to open it up here to uh, Q and A here. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, we have a question from 
uh, Jess here. Um, are you using any specific data modeling tool or a tool for prescriptive analysis? And Jess also asks, um, how are you analyzing data in real time? Sure. Uh, so today I still use Salesforce as my modeling tool because the amount of data that I'm pushing in has not, is not breaking Salesforce yet. Obviously mm -hmm. tools like Domo or Tableau are ideal for something like that. Um, but my good buddy here at Syncury is helping me to get that data into Salesforce so that I can use Salesforce for the modeling and then I can put it on dashboards or even on the account record themselves so that I'm sharing that with the reps. Um, we are not doing it in real time. Um, well, let me rephrase that. Some of it is happening in real time. A lot of it, like the ICP analysis um, and the product usage data, all of that ha is happening in snapshots, whether it's weekly or monthly. Um, so I would say that's where I'm starting. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if you have the budget for or time to take on uh, different tool sets, clearly those things work and they are successful for a reason. I am a, a Salesforce guy and I like putting the data at the hands of the reps. So that's just where my comfort level is right now. Sure, and it sounds like Syncery is also helping to bring uh, data that reps might not have direct access to into the place where they're doing their work. So that's pretty cool. Correct. Awesome. Um, Let's see, do we have any other questions? So under the uh, Q&A, uh, we had an anonymous question that says, why are the number of sales touches going up? Too many solutions in the marketplace. Um, have we hit saturation? Our business is so starving for resources that good enough is okay. Um, wow, that's that's probably a whole, a whole <laughs> that's, webinar. It's a couple of hours, itself. yeah. Um, I would say it's a little a category A, it's a little a category B. Um, I think the market has evolved so that a number of things are probably accurate. By the time that the seller come, by the time that the buyer comes inbound, they've already done a lot of their research and they don't really want to talk to a sales rep. Um, it's very easy now to hide behind caller ID and not take phone calls. And I think. I'm certainly not calling out any sales reps that I've ever worked with in my history, but a lot of sales reps don't like rejection and it's easier to send an email than it is to try some other form of communication that may result in a negative response. So I think when you look at the, the combination of those three things, I think you're seeing why it takes more touches and uh, we need to focus on the quality of those touches as much as we possibly can. Yeah, and I would add to that that the, um, the tools themselves can make it really easy to spray and pray if um, you, know, you don't have uh, uh, an idea about customizing messages. It's easy to just execute the sequence, put somebody in sequence and move on. And if uh, your team isn't focusing on making those interactions better, um, you know, you'll get hundreds of messages that go out that are undifferentiated. So that's probably another reason. Excellent. Another yeah. question from the, uh, in the Q&A is, are there oddities, do we see oddities in inbound versus outbound conversion ratios? Absolutely, 100%. Um, and you just have to, you just have to know that some sequences are built for inbound because what you're gonna say, the conversation that you're gonna have is radically different than trying to to help that with outbound. And so I'm a, uh, I'm a huge, huge proponent of outbound um, because it gives all of your reps more at bats, which allows them to improve their quality over, you know, in real time. So that when they do get one of those inbounds, they're not cutting their teeth on inbound. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, when you when you find that uh, we talked about inbound versus outbound, when you find that an, a particular source is doing well, do you then double down on that source, or do you kind of let it ride and um, you know evaluate it uh, sort of weekly, monthly? 
Um, well, we're in the business of making money. So obviously <laughs> double, double down is the answer. Um, but also you have to look at that data and then go, okay, what else looks like this so that I can experiment and try to triple down? You know what I mean? Um, and see what works. All right. Well, your software makes that much easier. So appreciate that. Uh, it looks like we had another question that got bubbled up uh, from Michael that what metrics were you looking at in top of funnel to connect the ICP to existing client profiles? So we looked at um, industry, uh, employee count, and uh, primary buyer job title as um, things that we could quickly attribute to our existing customers and then work backwards into the marketing for top of funnel activities uh, to make sure that we're, we're going after customers that have the propensity to be in our ICP. All right. And then uh, Jack asks in the Q&A, how much personalization are your reps doing for video prospecting? I think, um, I think we've tried two ways. I think we've tried recording a generic Loom video uh, and sending that out. And then I, I know that we're trying to do something more personalized um, based on the, on the target prospect. Um, I think the personalization has hit better uh, than the generic, um, but I think there's still a little bit of uh, an industry acceptance to click on videos from people that you didn't opt into from a security perspective. So I think video prospecting uh, still has a little bit of ways to go. All right, well. On that note of uh, video, and let's uh, send everyone out. Um, thank you, Rev Genius. Thank you, Sam. Um, if anybody is interested in learning more about Syncry, you can check us out, syncry.com. Sign up for our uh, newsletter, our Data Superheroes newsletter. And um, I hope you all have uh, an excellent Tuesday, giving you 13 minutes back, and uh, appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone.